pray, pray for him. So, Father, we just thank you for Christian, Lord. We thank you for the life that you've given him, Father. We thank you for all the blessings in his family, Lord. Lord, we pray that you just bless him and continue growing in him each and every day, Father. And, Lord, we just pray that you bless the word that he has today, Father, so that it can be food for our souls, Father, and that can just bear fruits, Father. So, Lord, we just thank you for what you're doing in his life each and every day, Father. So, Lord, we bless him and his family, Lord. In the name of Jesus, amen. Good morning, everyone. How you guys doing? It's good to be here. As, as Andres uh, just quickly mentioned, Reinhardt is uh, sharing over in, in one of our churches in the U.S. He's going down to New Orleans. And he's asking for a prayer, guys. So just uh, ask you to please, you know, back him up in prayer. Uh, as you know, he's, he's been sharing a lot on, on the gifts of the Spirit, sharing a lot on, on how God expects us to move, you know, freely anywhere we go. And as he's, you know, putting forth these teachings, there's always spiritual uh, opponents or there's always spiritual warfare going on behind the scenes because the devil doesn't want us to truly know and have access to God's power, guy. And, you know, God's power is the Holy Spirit. Sorry. It's over there. So we, we have to know that Christ in us, the hope of glory, that is... A huge and amazing gift that God has given us, which is His presence within, and that's exactly what Reinhardt is doing. You know, God is opening doors for him to everything that we've been learning here, everything that you guys are learning, not only on the Sundays but on the Mondays. You know, God is opening a lot of doors for whatever God is doing here to go into other parts of the world, and we have to open our eyes and see that God is doing something. And at times, you know, we we get caught into you know, what we're able to see in the physical, and we don't realize what God is doing in the supernatural. And I think it's amazing to see what God is doing, how he's opening doors for your congregation. And just, you know, the more so for us to continue to pray, continue to pray for your leaders, continue to just put God's word into practice so that we can get to wherever he wants us to be. And also I want to just give you a quick, you know, uh, greetings from our Mississauga church. You know, just please receive a hug from them. Please receive you know, a, a warmly blessing from, from the congregation down there. God is also in the move. God is doing many things. Uh, like your congregation, God is just steering us up. He's just moving us into going truly to the word of God, going truly into putting his word into practice. We're, you know, learning more about what it is to, to truly revive that gifting in us, to truly bring to life that fire that God has put in us. And we'll talk a little bit about that today, but... You know, it, it's something amazing to see that God is just all over the place, just trying to uh, shake things up. Not trying to. God's God. He does what he does. But, you know, it, it's almost like we need a little shaking at times to be reminded of the things that we ought to be doing as a church. And again, the church is not the walls. It's not the organization or the institution. The church is us, right? We're, we're live. We're alive. We're live organisms, if you want to put it that way. God compares us to, to parts of the body which are alive, connected to, to the mainframe, connected to, to, to Jesus. So that's who we are. We're live organisms. We're supposed to be reproducing. We're supposed to be creating. We're supposed to be just transmitting that life who is Jesus Christ in us. And today I want to talk to you a little bit about going from glory to glory. And what does that mean? You know, a lot of the times we hear that verse thrown around and, you know, a lot of people just say it's going from victory to victory or, you know, it's supposed to be from better to, to from good to better. And however you want to look at it, that's, that's all true, but there's more to it when we talk about the glory of God. And, you know, we were singing today some songs, you know, making reference to God's glory and, Lord, we want to worship you and we want to experience your glory but what does that truly mean? What does it mean to experience the glory of God? And I want you to ask yourself that question. I don't know if you have asked yourself that question. I don't know if you're aware that God's glory is within. I don't know if you're aware that God, you know, wants to constantly manifest His glory in your life. But more than looking at glory as a, as a quality or as a gift or as an adjective, the glory of God is truly Jesus Christ. And I want us to just pay attention to that today, to truly internalize this word, and that we can see Jesus Christ as the glory of God, so that we can see the magnitude of the fullness of Christ in us. Because that is 
such a key differentiator for us to move into the things that God wants us to do. It's a big differentiator for us as Christians to truly be able to, to, to manifest God's glory, power, all the blessings, all the promises. And I'm not here to just tell you it's all good and dandy from here on. But I'm saying, you know, there is more to it than what we're experiencing. God is God. And if Jesus is the glory of God, that means we haven't even begun to experience truly the fullness of God. Amen? So let's go to 2 Corinthians 3.18. And this is what it says. For, in, in, for, whoops. for it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God, where? In whom? In the face of Jesus Christ. That's pretty amazing, guys. Look what it's saying again. I just want to take it from the part that says that he has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of God. What is it to know the knowledge of God, to have the knowledge of God? And we're going to see a couple, a couple of people in Scripture that truly made their life purpose to acquire the knowledge of who Jesus Christ was or, or is and who God is so that they could truly have a meaningful life and a life that went beyond even having kingdoms, even having many things, even having everything at their disposal, but understanding that life had to be more than just material things and things of, of this earth. If we continue on the next slide, please. You know, I found this on the net, and I thought this is pretty cool because when we talk about God's glory... You know, and we know that we have to be resembling Jesus Christ. You know, if, if the glory of God shown in the face of Jesus Christ is revealed as God's glory, who are we supposed to reflect? We're supposed to reflect Jesus Christ, right? We talk a lot about in our vision that we have to build the character of Jesus Christ in our lives. And why is that important? Because Christian, as, as the way I am, with all my imperfections, with all the things that I have in my life that are no good, if it was me that people were looking at without Jesus Christ, yeah, I could pass on maybe at times as a decent guy. It's kind of fun sometimes. But the majority of the time, if people truly knew what was inside of me without the, the Word of God, without Jesus Christ, what, truly, what true darkness is just kind of creeping from within? You know, and the Bible says that God is the one who knows the hearts. He's the only one who truly knows their hearts, even at times better than ourselves. It says that the, hearts, the heart is deceiving. So if the heart is deceiving, at times we like to trick ourselves into thinking that we are good. But the Bible says that good is only God, right? So mirror, mirror on the wall, do you see Christ in me at all? You know the, the story, right? The fairy tale. But truly, have we ever thought about this? You know, can people see Jesus Christ reflected in me? Can people truly see the glory of God shining in my countenance, shining, shining in my face, in the same way that people would see the glory of God reflected in Moses? And we're going to get a little bit into that as we go along. If we go to the next slide, please. 2 Corinthians 3, 16, 17. It says, Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is a spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. If we go to the next one, please. And one more, and the 18 there. But we all, with unveiled face, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So what does that mean, guys? It says that now with an unveiled face, before Moses... And in the Old Testament, we'll see the priests who'd go before the presence of the Lord where the ark used to be, and they would cover their heads. They would cover their faces because they had to show their reverence. They could not really have an encounter face-to-face -face with God. And that's what that symbolism used to be of that covering, showing the respect, the fear of the Lord, and also that there was a separation between God and man. That was back in the day. But it says now that us, having now Jesus Christ in us, we don't need to cover our faces anymore. We don't need to come before God with an unveiled, with a cover, with a veiled face. Now we can enter freely without having to worry about that separation between man and God. And why is that? Because we have the glory of the Lord who is Jesus Christ in us. We know that by the blood of Christ we have been redeemed, we have been washed clean, and now we can boldly access the presence of God. But then it says there that as we 
look ourselves in the mirror, beholding the glory of God, having turned to God, to Christ Jesus, we are to be transformed in the same image of Jesus Christ, right? So the more I'm experiencing the knowledge of God, the more I'm acquiring the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is, I cannot remain the same person. I should not be remaining or being the same person over and over again, guys. And this is a, a, a something that it's a little bit challenging at times. It's a little bit confronting when we see ourselves struggling with the same things over and over again. And we say, Lord, why am I again into this? Why can I not kick this habit off? Why am I still suffering with this and that? And mean, meanwhile, we're not experiencing the glory of God. So the question is, are we not able to move on forward into victory because we cannot see God as who He is? We cannot see truly the knowledge of God internalized in our hearts and then transforming us into moving from glory to glory? And I ask these questions rhetorically because sometimes we don't think about it, guys, but we find ourselves in the same rut. We find ourselves in the same stagnant position where we're not moving forward. We're not moving forward spiritually. We're not moving forward in the natural as well. And, and trust me, when God says that he will prosper us as our souls prosper, when our soul is prospering, guys, we ought to be prospering ourselves as well. And prospering means in many ways. It could be your health. It would be your relationships. It could be your finances. It could be many things. But God has called us to truly prosper in our soul so that he can bless every other area in our lives. And how does that work? As we prosper in our soul, that means that we are going from glory to glory. We're hungering the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We're wanting to know Jesus Christ and who he is, how he reacts, how he speaks to us, how his emotions are, how his personality and his character is, so that I could get a little bit of that in myself, so that I can improve my life in that same way. You know, if Jesus is love and I cannot love back, then there's something that's not right. And, you know, there's many things of the soul, many things in my heart that I will probably need healing for so that I can receive that love. But the moment I, I'm longing for the knowledge of Christ and the moment that I know that Jesus is love and the moment that I realize I cannot love, now the word of God has penetrated deep as, as in my heart, as into the bone, into the bone marrow. It says the word separating righteousness and evil and just bringing the truth forward. And now that I see the truth into my life, now I have a choice, right? It's not going to be easy at times, but I have a choice. I know the truth. And that's why it says you shall know the truth, and truth shall set you free. If I know the truth, if Jesus is love, I'm just using that as an example. If I know Jesus is love, I cannot love, but I want to love. And I read that verse in Scripture. Now I know, wait a minute, if Jesus is within me, then that means I ought to be able to love back. What do I need to do? And then I begin, you know, hungry and, Lord, I want to know more about you. I want to know more how you told your disciples that they should love their enemies and forgive those who do harm to them. And then as I begin to reason in that way, I find other scriptures where I say that I cannot be God's friend or find forgiveness through God if I don't myself forgive. And then I begin to realize, okay, now i got to change all these things in my life. And I begin to now move forward and putting that word into practice. Now I'm starting to look a little bit more like Jesus. And next time I look at myself in the mirror... I'm being transformed from glory to glory. And that is what the power of the word of God is, guys. And that is what the power of the glory of God is. You know, and when we talk about being in that transformative process of becoming like Jesus Christ, it's not a thing that happens on the Sunday. It's not a thing that happens on the Monday. It's got to become a lifestyle for us. All of us need to be longing and saying, this is my sole purpose, to know Jesus Christ and to look like Jesus Christ in sense of character, in sense of his likeness and his image. And as I become like him, as I'm able to conduct and behave the, the way Jesus Christ did, then I ought to become to experience God tangibly. And that's where I want to get to. You know, we talk about the gifts. We talk about God's presence. We talk about, you know, being able to sense, you know, how beautiful and how amazing. We long for those days to see, you know, how in the temple, when the temple was opened up, we were in the Old Testament, it said that the presence of God felt so thick, so strong in that place that everybody fell to the ground. And as everybody's on the ground, it said that nobody could even play an instrument or do anything. It was just God that was just made himself manifest in that place. You know, and, and we've had glimpses of that glory here and there. 
And, you know, and when we experience it, everybody cries, everybody laughs, people are just being redeemed, people are being uh, convicted of sin. The Holy Spirit begins to do His work. But wouldn't you want to live a lifestyle where every time that you're just longing for the knowledge of God, that you're longing to be more like Jesus, that you can tangibly feel that presence. That you can truly say, you know what? Something is happening from within. I'm going into my secret place to pray and say, Jesus, I want to know you. And suddenly I'm just crying because God is speaking into my heart. Suddenly I feel God's presence. They say, I've never felt this before. What is this? God, this is amazing. I want more of this. I want to know you more. What do you want me to do with this experience? How am I going to help other people? How am I going to be a better person? See, that is the lifestyle of a Christian. That is how we ought to be experiencing Jesus Christ in our lives every day. If we go to the next slide, please. Fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Sorry, guys. Let's go. Moving on, please. First Corinthians 2, 10, 12. That is the key. You know, how do we attain, how do we acquire the knowledge of Jesus Christ? How do we get to know him? How do, do we experience him tangibly? And it's through the Holy Spirit. It says, but God has revealed them to us. This is talking about all the great things that God has prepared for us. That's what the chapter is talking about. And it says, but God has revealed them to us through his spirit, for the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. You know, this is a verse that probably you've read here in church. You've talked about it a little bit. But look at that. It says that the spirit searches all things, the deep things of God. And as we continue to move on that chapter, it says that, you know, who knows better a person? Who knows better than our own spirit what we're thinking, what we're longing, what we're desiring, what it is that we're not doing or what we're doing? You know, it's our spirit that knows better than, than anybody else what truly is inside of us, what truly is in our hearts. Imagine the spirit of God. What do you think the spirit of God knows? You know, it says that, you know, in the beginning it was God... It was the Trinity, right? We read the beginning was the Word, and the Word became the flesh. And then as the Word was spoken, creation just began to happen through the power of the Holy Spirit. So we're able to see the Trinity together from the beginning, Father, Son, and the Holy, the Holy Spirit. And as we're able to see that God has been the same always and will continue to be the same forever, and we're able to see that the Holy Spirit, as far as Jesus, as far as, sorry, God, has existed, as far as even Jesus has been revealed to us and even existed from before the firmament of the earth, says the word. You know, imagine all the knowledge that the Spirit of God has about who God is, about who Jesus is, about what we're supposed to be doing, about how we relate to one another, about how we are to be experiencing His presence. It's, it's mind-blowing. I don't know if, if you ever thought about it, but if the Spirit of God wants to show me the deep things of God, if he wants to reveal to me the depths of the heart of my God, how much do I truly know? How much am I truly experiencing? You know, it's got to be something we long for, guys. It's got to be something that, that eats us alive every day. You know, we, we ought to meditate in the Word of God. We ought to think and say, God, you know, how, how do I get to know the deep things of you? Holy Spirit, teach me. Holy Spirit, I want to know, you know, the secret that's hidden here. I'm reading the scripture. I don't understand, but it sounds pretty amazing. I want to experience this tangibly. Help me, God. Teach me. Show me. This has got to be us, meditating in God, longing in God, and just not fixating our, our efforts, our purpose, and our strength in the things of this earth when the Bible says we ought to fixate our eyes on the things that are up above. Next slide, please. Then we go into John, we're going to read a couple of scriptures there, but if we look at John 14, 15, 17. And this is what I was talking about, making a lifestyle of us longing Jesus Christ, longing to be with God. God set forth some parameters, if you will. And it says, if you love me, keep my commandments. And I will pray to the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. So as Jesus was ascending back into heaven after he had been here on earth, you know, he said, don't worry about it. I'm, I need to go back to my father. I need to go back to God so that I can, so that when, we, when, when I'm up there, the father can send you another helper. So Jesus came to help us. Help us do what? The Bible says he came to reveal the father to us. Right? 
as we saw the Father through Jesus Christ, we begin now to see in the Gospels a new facet of God, a new face of God. Not God Almighty who brings judgment and just, you know, is there to wipe out nations and whatever. A lot of people seem to think that's what the Old Testament is all about, and it's not. But a lot of people have that image of God, and it's not that image. It's nothing to, to do with God. But see, Jesus came, and then he goes, I'm here to reveal the Father to you. If you have known me, how could you ask who the Father is? How could you ask to reveal the Father to you? Haven't you not been long enough with me? That's what he told his disciples. So he came to reveal the Father. He began revealing that God was not just everything that people had assumed or having that fear of having to come with a veil-covered face before the presence of God and, and fearing that if I'm in sin, I may pass into another life. It was no longer about that. It's now Jesus saying, my Father, your Father, he loves you. He wants to protect you. He wants to care for you. He wants to save humanity. That's what he sent me. He wants now to remove the veil so that we can have that close communion, that close fellowship with him as it was in the Garden of Eden, as it was intended from the beginning. And then he continues saying on in 17, The spirit of truth whom the world cannot, cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he dwells with you and will be in you. That's amazing. So now think about this. The Spirit of God reveals the deep things of God, the deep things of our Father, the deep things of Jesus Christ. And now Jesus is saying to us, I must go because the Father wants to send a helper who is the Spirit of truth, who is the Holy Spirit, who is the same Spirit that wants to reveal the depths of God to you and I. And now Jesus is saying, now that same spirit, who is the spirit of God, who can reveal you those truths, now dwells with you and will be in you. Isn't that amazing? It's incredible, guys. So when we now say, Holy Spirit, I want to know the depths of God. I want to truly have an understanding of the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. I don't have to kind of abstractly or mystically look up in heaven and say, Holy Spirit, where are you? God, show me something. Give me a sign. You know, that's what the Israelites would do. They would always be looking for the sign so that they could believe. And even with the signs, they still did not believe. But see, now we have the Holy Spirit in us, dwelling inside of us, in us. He is with us. He is inside of us. And he is longing to reveal the depths of God to you and I. He is longing to take us closer to God, to say, yes, God is real. Yes, God is love. Yes, God is everything that we know he is and that's in scripture. And things that we are not even yet to understand because we don't have perhaps the, the, the understanding or maybe we haven't gotten there. Spiritually, God is saying, I want to reveal to you. I will reveal to you. These are my secrets I want to entrust you with. If we go to the next one, please. And continue saying on in verse 21, John chapter 14. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. So it's a lifestyle again, guys. It's not about doing what God says we ought to do because he is commanding us in the sense that you better do it or you're going to die. That was the law. That was the Old Testament. That's the way that people had to live back then. Why? Because they did not have the Holy Spirit inside of them. They did not have God's loss in their minds and their hearts as we do now after Christ Jesus died on the cross for us. That is the power of that sacrifice. And then it says, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him. And what? Manifest myself to him. How do you think God manifests to us today? Yes, he manifests through my brethren, through you guys. That's how I'm able to see Jesus Christ reflected in your life. And then I say, yeah, Corey, I can see Jesus Christ working in you, man. I can see that transformation happening. I'm able to see that, and that builds me up. That edifies my life. The same way of you, Ramon, you, Jeremy. You know, I can see God moving. That is one way God manifests. But if I'm able to see that the Holy Spirit is within me, the Holy Spirit is within you, each one of you, and we're here collectively obeying God. We have a lifestyle where we're saying, God, we love you. God, we're obeying your commandments. We're carrying out what your word says. And then we're constantly that living sacrifice, as Romans 12 tells us, that we ought to present ourselves to God as a human sacrifice. Because that is the pleasant, acceptable worship to God. 
It's not about coming Sunday and just singing five songs, five worship songs and saying, God, where is your presence? God, I can't feel anything. God, you know, I haven't felt your presence in the last five months. That church doesn't manifest God's glory. i got to go to a different one. That is nonsense, guys, because my pleasant and acceptable worship to God is me being a living sacrifice before him, a human sacrifice. No, not a human, a living sacrifice. I want to make sure that's clear. <laughs> We ought to present ourselves as a living sacrifice. What does that mean? That means that it's no longer I who live, but it's Christ who lives in me. It's no longer I live my life because I'm going after my pleasures and desires, but it is now because I want to experience the power of resurrection of God and want to experience God in me, moving in me and through me. Go to the next scripture, please. James 4, 5. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously. Point number three. One, the Holy Spirit can reveal the depths of God to us. Wants to reveal the depths of God to us. Number two, the Holy Spirit was sent by the Father as our helper. And he is not only our helper today, but as we, as we turn to God, as we put God's commandments into practice, as we obey the Lord and we show that we love him in that obedience... The Holy Spirit comes and dwells inside of us. Now he is with us. Now he is inside of us. Three, not only is he now in us, he is yearning jealously for us. God wants to show you everything about who he is through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is now within and now he's saying, I jealously yearn after you. I jealously desire you. I jealously want your heart to be tapped in with God's heart. I jealously want to spend time with you. I want you to spend time with me. I want you to, to, to experience God not for only for who he is, but I want you to reveal the secrets of God and you experience the presence of God tangibly in your life. You see the amazing gift that we've been giving through the Holy Spirit. And it's not just having some, some energy or having some awesome thing. No, it's God himself inside of us longing to show the depths and yearning for us jealously. David is who comes to mind after. I found that picture. Not that God is the galaxy or anything like that, but... Can you imagine the moment that we're in God's presence after our bodies are regenerated, us, after we're able to, to be in God's glory, you know, forever and eternity? How, how, how is that going to be? I cannot imagine. You know, we look at our galaxy today. We look at our, the creation here on earth. You know, when we truly see, you know, untapped sceneries or nature that is just virgin, we are so odd. We're so, you know, dumb felt, I guess, if, if you want to use that term, of how amazing creation is, how amazing the galaxy is. And when we begin to look at planets and, and galaxies and stars, it, it's totally out of this world. It's totally amazing. And that is just a little speck within God's creation. That is just tiny. And can you imagine God himself, the day that we're able to gaze upon God, that we're able to just have a glimpse of God's beauty. But you see, today in the spirit, we're able to already tap into that. We're already able to see God's beauty. Maybe not in the physical, because right now we're not able to see God with our eyes in that sense. But we're able to experience God's beauty in his personality. We're able to experience God's beauty in his character. And how he is, how he provides for us, how he saves us, how he protects us, how he is our, our, our peace, how he is our love, how he is all those great things that we know that he is to us. If we go to the next scripture, Psalms 27, 4, I believe it's just kind of like in the, in the crack there. But look what David would say. And I just find this, this scripture amazing because David, in his early years, he would experience being that shepherd boy. And he would fight off beasts, says the scripture, right? He would fight off the lions and the bears that would come after the sheep. And somehow this guy was built with faith, and he would just confront these beasts and just take them down and kill them himself. It's a guy who had courage. It's a guy who, who had, you know, an identity, somebody who knew 
you know, who was with him. I'd say, you know, if, if you don't believe God is with you, and if you don't believe, I wonder how many of us would actually want to face a giant or a beast or an enemy. You know, it would be kind of hard. Maybe for survival instincts, we may do it. But we know this, this, the, the, the story of David, and we know how his heart was a heart after God's heart. And it says, one thing I ask from the Lord, this only I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To what? To gaze on the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. That was David's purpose. Then he becomes king. After his king wins many wars, battles, starts taking over the land that God had given them. Guy becomes like a king warrior. Becomes somebody who is very astute, very smart, very wealthy. And even then, having everything that he had, his heart is saying, I want to dwell in the house of my Lord so I can gaze upon his beauty. Is that our prayer, guys? Is that what we're truly after? Do we sit down at times and say, just Lord, I truly want to make my life purpose to just gaze upon your beauty, to know your knowledge, to truly understand who you are. What does it mean to have you dwell in my heart? God, I'm obeying you. God, I've presented my life as a living sacrifice before you. It's now my acceptable worship to you. Now manifest yourself to me. Manifest yourself to me. Next scripture, please. Philippians 3.10. When we look at that scripture in, in Psalms, you know, and, and we compare it to Paul, we know that Paul had that encounter. He was persecuting the church at the time. He was the guy. He was like the guy who knew the law. He was the guy who was really jealous and zealous for keeping, you know, the Hebrew tradition. And here's Jesus Christ now that has come, and now the disciples, then Jesus has ascended. The disciples are preaching the gospel. The church is beginning to grow. And now here's a Paul that gets assigned with persecuting the church because it's become something that's evil in their eyes. Right? So Paul becomes this really evil person, if we will. That's how the, the church would see him at the time. You know, a guy who was like the executioner. He was the inquisitor of the time. And then Jesus reveals himself to him. Just, it was so powerful that he says that it was just a blinding light. That literally, when the light appeared before him, he fell to the ground and he was made blind. And he has that encounter with Jesus Christ. That was something in the physical that God used. God manifested himself to him, not because of what we're talking about, because God had a purpose in his life. How much more so does God want to manifest to us, guys? And then after he's had that experience, after now he's crazy and wholeheartedly for the Lord, after now he's seeking God and now he's a friend of the church, he's a friend of the Lord's, he says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings becoming like him in his death. He wants to know God and the power of his resurrection. And this is what I, what, what I, what I just want to think. You know, he's just making his whole life to know Jesus. This is somebody who knew a lot of things, guys. He was very well studied. He was very wealthy for his time. And then as we keep reading chapter 3 and chapter 4 of Philippians, we say that, you know, my sole objective is to attain the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Everything else is garbage. And we know these scriptures, guys. But what cost these great men of God to make their sole purpose to have that experience with God, to truly live in the glory of the Lord, to truly see a manifestation of God in their lives? Next scripture, please. 1 Peter 4.12. See, Paul now is saying, I want to also partake in the sufferings of God. And this is another way that God... Ex allows us to manifest or allows us to experience the manifestation of his heart, of his presence. You see, it is that fellowship with the Holy Spirit. It is us truly turning on to God, obeying God. And there's a part two where we've just let go of our desires and our pleasures. Now that we can say, God, if time came to be, I am willing to give it all for you. I'm willing to suffer with you. I'm willing to suffer for you. You see, and to become somebody who no longer is concerned with their desires and their pleasures, who truly allows now Christ to live through our lives, 
who truly is a person who's not selfish or indulge in, in oh, what, what about my things? What about me? And I'm not saying that you shouldn't focus on the things that you need to continue your living. But if that's your sole priority, if that's your sole purpose, the moment that you lose that, what's going to happen? What's going to happen to your identity? What's going to happen to your purpose? What's going to happen to who you are as a person? Because see, if there's one thing that does not change, it's God, guys. God is the same before, now, and always. And if there's something that is constant in the world, it's change. You know, we hear this in the business world all the time. If there's one constant thing, it's change. And it's true. Things are always changing. But God does not change. So you see, here we're looking at all this change and we want to adapt. And we're almost like chasing behind the currents and the trends. And we're just like so busy in routine, so busy into that. And we would let the world tell me what's successful. I, tell the, I love the world to tell me what's good, what's not good. But meanwhile... God's word shall never pass. Meanwhile, God will never change. The same things that he has said continue today and will continue to be tomorrow. But yet, I'm looking to adapt myself to the things that are changing in the world constantly and not grounding myself in the one thing that does not change. If you're reproached for the name of Christ, blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. So tell somebody, Jesus is good. So what if they reject you? So what if they make fun of you? So what if they say, oh, this guy's a nut. This guy's a fanatic. This guy's a religious. So be it. If that's what it takes for me to have the glory of God rest upon my life, it's really no price to pay, guys. But who are we fearing the most? Are we fearing man or are we fearing God? You see, when we walk that lifestyle of truly being in the glory of God, looking at ourselves in that mirror, seeing that transformation happening, seeing a little bit more of Jesus in me, seeing a little bit more of Jesus in your life, being edified by more of Jesus in you, being changed by more of Jesus in me, things begin to happen. The world begins to be better. My surroundings begin to differentiate and be changed. Why? Because now I see things with God's perspective. Now I see things as Jesus would see things. Because we have the mind of Christ is a word, right? That takes us to the next point. Evangelism, guys. It's a priority for us. But you see, evangelism, if we're not taking into account what we're talking about, guys, a lot of times we fear people. A lot of times we're not going to have the passion to do it. A lot of times we're going to be too busy chasing after the constant changes that are happening in the world, in society, in our lives, in our families, wherever it may be. And we're abandoning the knowledge of Jesus Christ. We're abandoning, fixating our eyes on the things up above. Next one, please. 2 Timothy 1, 6, 7. And the Lord has been speaking this scripture to us in, in the Mississauga congregation, guys. Oh, yeah? See, the, the Lord knows. And it's amazing because as you look at this scripture, Paul talking to Timothy, you know, God is speaking to his church saying, shake it off. It's time to shake it off. I've given you everything you need. Don't go asking for more. Don't go asking how do you fix my problem. Don't go suffering for this for no reason when God is already in you. When the Holy Spirit is longing to show you the depths of God, the answers that are within God. When the Holy Spirit is saying, I want to manifest myself to you. I want to be resting upon you so that you can have the strength that you need. So that you can move forward in victory. You can move forward evangelizing. You can move forward seeing a transformation in your life. And this is what he says to Timothy. He says, therefore, I remind you to stir up the gift of God which is in you through the laying of my hands. Why would Paul encourage Timothy to stir up that gift? Because in our walk in Christianity, guys, there's times where we're not seeing things in the physical. And we forget that we, we, we're spiritual beings. We forget that God manifests and is always on the move. But we tend to look and just believe in the things that we see when God says that faith is the things that I cannot see and the things that I must be certain of when I don't see them, right? Especially from God. But then how do I stir up that gift? How do I make that gift truly become alive again? I don't know if you've ever practiced any sports. Michael here could tell you. 
You know, when, when, where's Mike? Is he there? Okay. I think he was just a little while doing a lot of biking, and then he hurt his foot. So, and another time he was hurt too. But the thing is, when you're an athlete, and you hurt yourself, and you stop practicing, then you get weak again. You get comfortable again. You feel like you're out of shape. But you got to get yourself back into gear. You got to start practicing again. You got to start getting your game back, back on so that you can get back to what you were doing before to the same level and continue to move forward. If we as Christians, guys, if we've been given gifts, if we've been given abilities, if we've been given ministries, and suddenly we just say, oh, nothing's happening, so I'm not going to do it anymore. Oh, that person criticized me. I didn't like it. I'm not going to put it in practice anymore. Oh, people don't listen to my ideas. I'm not going to do it anymore. See, all these lies, guys will make us stagnant if we believe the things that people expect from us or want from us or tell us that we are and not go to God for the things that we should be going to. The Holy Spirit wants to reveal God to us, wants to rest upon us. Regardless of what we're seeing, we have to believe. We have to have our faith put into practice. Because without putting our faith into practice, says James, it may as well be dead. And that's why we talk so much about putting the Word of God into practice, guys. Because if I'm not practicing the Scripture, if not putting the Word of God into practice, that means that I'm not believing it or I'm too afraid to put it into practice. And if I'm too afraid to put it into practice, God says, I've not given you a spirit of fear, but of power and self-control. And all fear is cast out by the love of the Father. So that means i got to fix some things in my heart. That means i got to start believing, you know, God is stronger in me than in the world. i got to start believing that God has set me free. And as I begin that healing process, that transformative process, getting to know God in that exchange we're talking about, eventually I have to break out of that prison. Because God, you know, he says we're not given the spirit of bondage so that we can fear, so that we can be afraid of things. But rather we've been given a spirit of adoption by whom we can now say, my daddy, I've been adopted. You see why it was so important that Jesus came to reveal the Father to us? Because what sets us free is truly having that comfort, that security, that revelation that my Father, who loves me, who has kept me, who is wanting to redeem me through Jesus Christ by having sent his only child to die on the cross, then I begin to see God in that dimension of love, of father-child. That is so important for us to heal our hearts. That it's so important for us to break away from fear. Fear of men. Fear of what's going to happen tomorrow. Fear, anxieties, stress, etc., etc. The Holy Spirit wants to reveal the depths of God, your Father, to you. Next script. Oh, yes, next. John 15, 26, 27. But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father... The spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. The Holy Spirit will testify of Jesus and the Father in our lives first. We get a revelation, that's why we come to Christ. The Holy Spirit now is testifying of what Jesus Christ came to do, who Jesus Christ is. And then it says, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. I'm saying this to the disciples. But now we have the Spirit, guys. So we also have to bear witness because we have the Spirit who has been with God since the beginning. We cannot be believers. We cannot be children of God, walking in the glory of God without giving witness of what God has done in our lives, without giving witness of what Jesus has done. It's important. It's a priority. Next one, please. Ephesians 3, 18, 19. And I just kind of cut it off there just so that we can see the magnitude of what the love of God is. It goes in all directions, guys. And this is why I love the scripture. It says, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length. So, you know, the width, the length. I don't know which way you want to go or which way is which. But then it says, and the depth and the height. So God is deep. God is high. God is long. His love is wide. That is how wide his love goes. That is how high, how deep. Every direction, guys. 
And we are just one little tiny speck in this galaxy. Imagine if the earth is a speck in the galaxy. How much smaller are we? But yet God chose to make our hearts his dwelling place. Not a temple, not a structure, not our organization, but us, his creation. The highest of his creation, as the word says. And continue saying in the 18, to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. See, all these scriptures are so powerful, guys, because when we first read them, it's almost like, oh, that sounds so nice, so beautiful. But when you take each and every word, how it relates to the knowledge of God, how it relates to the love of God, that wants, the love that God wants to reveal about himself, how we can see what the fullness of God truly is in comparison of who we are as, as part of the creation or what the world is as part of the galaxy or whatever, as, as far as you want to go into, into that analogy or example. But to understand that the fullness of God truly has no limit for us. We're so tiny. Our minds cannot comprehend. But it says that when we're able to experience the love with all the saints in that dimension, that it has to surpass all knowledge. It has to go beyond my understanding, my human wisdom. It needs to go beyond all that, guys, because otherwise I'm not going to be able to tap in and comprehend the things of God. It says that we ought to come like children so that we can see the kingdom of heaven. But a lot of times we've been trained, we've put ourselves into all this, and then we cannot compete the things of God because we don't allow God to operate. We don't know that God truly came wanting to reveal the depths of God and saying, now I'm in you, and not only in you, I jealously desire for you to have a relationship with me. But am I truly having a relationship with God? How do I expect to move forward into the knowledge of Christ and truly experience His presence and His glory if I'm not making an effort? And this is something God is talking to our congregation in Mississauga, guys. And I felt to share the same with you. Because it doesn't matter where you are in your Christian walk, in your Christian life. The fullness of God is too much. It's too big. But the word of God says that he who wants more, he who wants more grace, there is more. And I don't know about you guys, but I want more. Do you guys want more? Yes, we want more. That's why we sing these songs. You know, we want more. And they love this song here. I know Rainer loves it. <laughs> Is that the last one in theirs? I think that's the last. I'm just going to ask you to be on your feet and just close your eyes for one second. I just want to make a prayer with you. If this is something that you're feeling your heart burning today, if you feel God just saying, yes, you need to know me more. I am there to show you the deep things about who I am. I want to reveal to you my secrets. I want to free you from fears. I want to free you from slavery. And by slavery, I mean, you know, any bondage that we have, perhaps addictions or habits, perhaps, you know, just uh, things in the mind that we cannot move past it because we've been hurt, we've been betrayed, whatever the case may be. That's the bondage that it's referring to. If you're saying, I'm tired of that, I need Jesus Christ manifested in my life, I need Jesus Christ reflected in me, trans transforming my heart, transforming my life, so that I can see Jesus Christ as looking at that mirror, seeing him manifested in me, taking me from glory to glory, then I just invite you to just say to God in your own words, wherever you are, Lord, I want this. God, don't make me go back to the same comfort zone. Don't make me go back to the same patterns. I want to see a change in my life. I want to see things happening. But more importantly, I want to be able to dwell in your house and gaze upon your beauty each and every day. Father God, I thank you for your presence. I thank you for who you are, God. Holy Spirit, I ask you in this moment that we're able to just sense and feel your presence. God, we're here as a living sacrifice to you, God. Saying that we love you. You know that we love you, God. You know that we struggle, that we go through each day 
at times just maybe sinning, at times maybe just not trusting in you enough, at times not putting your word into practice. But we love you, God. But God, we want to see truly through knowing you, Jesus Christ, through now understanding the power and the blessing the Holy Spirit is in us, as he is our helper, as he is the spirit of truth, that I'm able truly, God, to see the, the things that you've said already, to see life, to see you in the light that the Holy Spirit sees. Because the spirit in you are one and the same, God. Thank you, God, for yearning jealously after me, for desiring to have a relationship with me. God, help me. Help me have that same heart. Help me have that same fire in me so that I can also jealously just long to be with you, God, that I can long truly, God, to spend time with you, to get to know you, to do everything that you desire, not because I need to do it, not because I'm going to get something in return, but simply because you are. Holy Spirit, strengthen us so that we can break free, so that we can walk out of those open cells, God. So that we can truly no longer fear, but rather just experience that spirit of power, experience that spirit of self-control, experience that spirit of adoption. So that we can have a true relationship as a father and a son or a daughter. Lord, I pray that in this place, God, your presence would always be manifested. That your presence would always be felt, God. That your presence, God, would just overwhelm the hearts of men and women as they're coming in through these doors. But not only in this place, physically speaking, God. That your spirit, God, would overwhelm our hearts so that when we speak your truth, so that we te when we testify of who you are, God, that people's hearts would also be overwhelmed by your beauty, by your grace, by your mercy, by your greatness, by the fullness of who you are, Lord Jesus. God, I pray in your name, Lord Jesus, that any chains, God, that are binding people to any habits, to any addictions, God, to any fear of man, to any fear of the future, any fear of tomorrow, that would just be broken right now in your name, Jesus. As your word says, God, that it is by your spirit that we're set free. It is through your word that we are set free. That this word, Father, that this seed that has been planted in our hearts would bring forth freedom, God. Freedom to move forward in your presence. Freedom to move forward in your glory, God. Freedom to move forward in the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is. Freedom to move forward having you as our sole purpose, having you, God, as our objective, just as Paul and David did, God. Holy Spirit, we desire your presence. We desire you. We desire to know Jesus. How we love you, God. How much we love you. Oh, God, let your presence, God, be so tangible in this place, Lord. Holy Spirit, convict us. Convict our hearts of those things that are not pleasant before you. Strengthen us to kick off sin of our lives. Strengthen us, Lord, so that we can stir up that gift in us. And I thank you, God, because there are many gifts in this place. I thank you, Lord, because you've given us so much. Hallelujah, Lord Jesus, we praise you. We praise you and we worship you, God.
Thank you, Jesus. I just want to ask if anybody has received a word or had a vision that you want to share. Maybe just can just go to Ramon. Don't stay quiet. Do you guys feel God's presence? His presence is strong, guys. And you know what's the most ama amazing thing? It's that we don't have to do anything. It's given to us by free, for free. That's the grace of God, guys. That through faith, we'd be justified so he can come and dwell in our hearts. Ramon's saying that he had a vision at the beginning. And he saw how the Lord had sent off letters. And it was a letter, a two-page letter. So two sheets, but double-sided, four, four pages. And the letter would open saying, my beloved son, daughter. And there, there was a message that was written for each one of us. And in the end, it was signed by Jesus. I believe that that letter, the message in the letter is the message that we received today. Because I wasn't able to read what was in the letter. But I do know that God spoke individually through that letter to each one of us. Anybody else? God's good, guys. You know, it's something I, I truly long in my heart is, I say, God, I truly want to learn to walk in your presence. You know, I want to truly learn to, to see yourself manifest in all areas of my life. You know, we're not perfect, guys, and we all have our struggles. But, you know, Romans 5, 1 to 5, it's one of my favorite passages because it keeps just saying, you know, that we've now been justified in, through faith. We've been given the grace of our Lord. And regardless of trials and tribulations and our challenges and our pro problems, that we have one certainty, and that certainty is Christ Jesus. And not only that, but that those struggles, those tribulations, the difficulties we go through in life, we go through them because we have been given the love of God by the Holy Spirit. And it goes back to everything we said. We need to truly see God in that dimension as our Father, guys, because that will bring freedom. It's the spirit of adoption. But at the same time, we need that fellowship with the Holy Spirit who wants to reveal to us the Father, Jesus, all the depths of God, who he is. Amen. It's good being with you guys. I don't know if Andres has some closing words. Uh, just before I, 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 I leave, guys, I just want to invite you as well. We're having a, a, a marriage couple uh, seminary on March 1st and 2nd. Uh, we're going to be going to, what's the name of it? St. Jacob's. It's uh, the little town close to Kitchener. We're going to be staying there in, in, a, in a hotel. Just, the idea is we, we show up on Friday night just so that we can start early on the Saturday because it's a little bit of a commute. Uh, but we'll have a little bit of fellowship, having a little bit of a, of a snack and light, light dinner, get to know everybody who's coming in, and then from 8 o'clock until noon, uh, the idea is that we, we, we hear what God wants to speak to us in that dimension. And then for lunch, we'll break off going into a restaurant into the local town. Uh, so if you, if, if you want to come out, you know, it's for married couples only. Uh, and the reason why, it's because we're staying overnight. So that's, that's part of why it's, it's the way it's built. Uh, we're going to have a guest from Mexico as well who's coming down. Uh, we have three rooms that are specifically reserved for this church, but at the same time we can expand by going to the hotel if there's more people interested in coming. 
So if you are, please let me know. We'll be really glad to have you guys, you know, have a, uh, a good time with us. So Andres, you know, that's it. Okay, so God bless you guys. Good to be here. And let's uh, share a time of, of food and fellowship. Um, if, if the men just want to help us with the tables, as we usually do, and then we'll just, we'll get things going on. So thanks, everyone. Music, please, Jessica. No problem. Thank you. Hey, hey, Jessica, can you put it down for a second? Jessica? Jessica in the back, just put it down for a second. Just put it down. Uh, while we are, uh, sorry guys, one, one last quick announcement. Sorry if I can have your attention. Um, the food is running a bit late. Um, so just hang tight. You know, we'll set up, get everything ready, and then we'll, we'll get the food ready. The, yeah. All right, thank you.